Welcome everyone to another episode of F1 Motor Fever Podcast. Today we're hitting the throttle with the incredible journey of Swiss engineer Peter Weiss de Araujo. Ah, Weiss de Araujo, a man of many talents and roles, his journey in motorsport is truly awe-inspiring. Indeed it is. Starting from his student days, lending a hand to Swiss drivers, mastering the art of multitasking with small teams, he's truly been through the mill. Absolutely, that hands-on experience surely defined his approach to motorsport. A keen logical thinker, a man of precision. Wouldn't you agree, George? Spot on, William. Then there's the unforgettable partnership with Gabriele Tarquini in the high-paced world of Formula One. Talk about punching above your weight. It wasn't all glitz and glamour for them. Operating with low-budget teams yet achieving a podium finish in Portugal is no mean feat. I hear you, William Turner. Trading Formula One for touring cars, Wisti Araujo truly showed his versatility, joining the Sibemi Engineering BMW team alongside Roberto Ravaglia. Ah, Ravaglia, a legend in his own right. Wisti Araujo spent a decade with the team, finding a delicate balance between rigidity and softness in car setup. A true masterclass. And let's not forget his stint with Campos Racing for GP2, later evolving into Formula 2. Working with top drivers like Romain Grosjean and Sergio Perez, his mark in the sport is undeniable. Oh yes, and the team's transition under Alejandro Agag, the name changed to Adex. Despite the challenges, Luis de Araujo remained committed to the team, a true testament to his dedication. Speaking of dedication, his move to the Dragon Formula E team shows his adaptability. Even in the face of a global pandemic, he sought new challenges, eventually joining Team Virage. Indeed, the European Le Mans series with Team Virage, a story of challenges, setbacks and successes. It's more than a career, it's a grand narrative in the world of motorsport. In his journey, Wis de Araujo has imparted valuable lessons for all, not just for aspiring engineers, but for anyone willing to take risks, learn and grow in their field. His story is more than just a career trajectory. It's an inspiration, a testament to the indomitable spirit of Peter Wisti Araujo. The motorsport industry is all the richer for his contribution. Absolutely, William. His story resonates far beyond the racetrack. It's a chronicle of passion, dedication, and the pursuit of excellence. It's simply timeless. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another special Thursday morning episode of F1 Motor Fever Podcast. It's your mate George taking the wheel from our usual host Enzo and joining me as our resident motor maestro, William. Thanks for the warm introduction, George. Always a pleasure to hop on board these thrilling Thursday specials. And we love having you, William. Now, for our loyal fans, you know what mornings like these mean. We're about to delve into an epic historical dive into the world of Formula One. And for those just tuning in, welcome to the fast lane. This is where we put the pedal to the metal and bring you the most entertaining, insightful, and downright exciting stories from the world of motorsport. And boy, do we have a fascinating one lined up for today. That's right, William. But before we rev up our engines, a quick pit stop. If you're enjoying our content, hit the subscribe button to join the F1 Motor Fever Podcast family. Don't forget to turn on the notifications so you never miss an episode. And do us a favor, will you? Drop us a comment. Share our content with your friends and family. Your support helps us keep delivering these thrilling stories to you. Absolutely every bit of your support counts, folks. Craving more details about our topic for today? Stick with us. Today we're talking about the incredible journey of Swiss engineer Peter Weiss de Araujo. His story is one of passion, dedication, and the pursuit of excellence in motorsport. It's a story we believe you'll find as inspiring as we do. So without further ado, eh... Full throttle, let's dive right in. So folks, let's delve a bit deeper into the fascinating journey of Peter Weiss de Araujo. This Swiss engineer has dipped his toes in virtually every discipline of motorsport, from hill climbing to Formula One, touring cars, and even a dash in Formula E. And his mantra has always been to keep learning. It's remarkable, isn't it? The constant quest for learning, the thirst for knowledge, it's something that sets successful people apart. Absolutely. Currently, he's race engineering an Orica Gibson 07 in the European Le Mans series for Team Virage, an outfit set up by an old colleague at Campos Racing. That's where Wisti Araujo had his longest stint and helped numerous drivers rise through the ranks. 
Ah, the European Le Mans series. A challenging and competitive environment. It's yet another testament to his adaptability and his ability to excel in different facets of motorsport. Indeed. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. His time in Formula One was fraught with difficulties, working with low-budget teams, jumping from Zack Speed to AGS, with a brief stint at Leighton House. He also had spells at Coloni and the short-lived Lamborghini outfit, where he experienced the brilliance and chaos of Mauro Forghieri. That's quite a list of experiences. It must have been tough, but as they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's interesting how Wis de Araujo had to figure out everything on his own, it really speaks to his resilience and determination. Precisely. His journey is a testament to the fact that in motorsport, as in life, you never stop learning. So folks, remember, no matter where you are in your journey, keep your eyes on the prize and never stop learning. Now, folks, it's always important to remind you where we get our information. And today's exciting dive into the life of Peter Weiss de Araujo comes from an article written by James Newbold on Autosport.com, published on the 2nd of April, 2024. Ah, Autosport.com, a reliable and respected source in the motorsport world. And James Newbold is a trusted voice in the field. But just like in racing, it's always good to cross-check your lines. Absolutely right. We always strive to bring you accurate, well-researched content. Now let's get back into the fast lane. Now let's shed some light on the various roles Wis de Araujo has held over his career, from race engineer to performance engineer and even technical director. A role he confesses was taken up out of necessity at the CBME Engineering BMW team. Sounds like a man willing to step up when the team needs it. The versatility he's displayed over his career is quite remarkable. Indeed. He views his zigzag trajectory philosophically, stating, Sometimes it's a situation where there is one job available and not the other one, so you go in and do what is needed for the team. That's a great mindset to have, not just in motorsport, but in any situation life throws at you. Adaptability is key to success. Absolutely. His motorsport journey started while he was still studying, helping various Swiss drivers. He recalls cleaning the bodywork, tires, and rims of Joe von Lanthen's Williams FW03 at the 1975 Austrian Grand Prix. A humble beginning, but important. It's in roles like these that one learns the nitty-gritty of the sport. You're right. In 1978, he engineered Patrick Studer's Chevron to the Swiss Formula 3 Championship. He also joined Studer at some European Formula 2 races and learned to do all manner of jobs himself. It's evident that he's been hands-on from the very start. It just proves that there's no shortcut to success. Every experience, no matter how small it seems, plays a crucial role in shaping one's journey. Well said. Wis de Araujo points out that in the early days, working in small teams, they didn't have the luxury of a clear division of labor. Hence, he had to wear many hats and learn to adapt quickly. Wis de Araujo makes an interesting point about the role of an engineer in motorsport. He says, The person engineering the car does everything. Performance engineer, race engineer, psychologist, the whole thing. It's not just about the technical aspects. It's also about understanding the driver, the team dynamics, and the psychology of racing. That's a crucial point. Motorsport, as we know, is not just about the machine, but the harmony between the machine and the human controlling it. Absolutely. It's also interesting to note that he didn't start out as an engineer by education. He spent two years studying engineering before deciding he didn't want to design bridges or trains. He switched to maths, completed a PhD at the University of Bern, and focused on forecasting the energy consumption of a country. That's quite a shift, isn't it? From designing bridges to forecasting energy consumption. But it's a fascinating testament to his adaptability and thirst for knowledge. Indeed it is. He says it doesn't matter what your educational grounding is because you learn the job in the first few years. He wanted to build his own lap time simulator, which he accomplished through studying and a love for science, numbers, and precision. His love for precision does feel very Swiss, doesn't it? Very much so. Mathematics, he says, teaches you to be a logical thinker, a skill instrumental in motorsport. After graduating in 1985, he began a productive relationship with Gabriele Tarquini that would span three different Formula One teams. Gabriele Tarquini, another great name in motorsport. Their partnership must have been quite a journey. It truly was. Beginning their journey with Alberto Colombo's San Remo Racing Squad in the inaugural season of Formula 3000, 
the partnership yielded a podium at their third attempt in Portugal. Incredible, isn't it? Truly remarkable. That's the sort of trajectory that shows the power of a strong partnership and the determination to succeed. Wisti Araujo and Tarquini took their talents to Colony in 1986. Despite only one podium finish in Austria, they remained unfazed. Chopping and changing parts to keep their year-old march competitive, they found themselves up against teams like Ligier, who had a team of 35 people around the car on the grid. Quite the spectacle, wasn't it? I'm sorry, but could you explain what you mean by chopping and changing parts? Absolutely. It's a term that refers to constantly modifying or adjusting certain components of the car in an attempt to enhance its performance. It's like trying to solve a puzzle, where you keep changing the pieces until you find the right fit. Ah, I see. It's quite a challenge then, particularly against larger, more resourceful teams. That's right. Despite the odds, Enzo Coloni saw an opportunity in F1 as its turbo era came to an end. His ambition, however, wasn't matched by resources. They entered the Ford-powered FC187 in two Grands Prix for Nicola Larini, and this was achieved with minimal manpower. As Wisti Araujo put it, we were two engineers designing a Formula One car. That was F1 as it was in the past. I was the race engineer of that car because it was the owner, me, and an engineer that didn't travel doing the updates. That's a different era of F1 racing when compared to the massive teams and resources we see today. Absolutely. And their hard work paid off in 1988 when they finished eighth in Montreal, after Tarquini had come through pre-qualifying to join Stefan Johansson's Ligier on the back row. It's a testament to their tenacity and resourcefulness, don't you think? Indeed, it's remarkable what they achieved with such limited resources. It's interesting how points were only awarded down to sixth place in those days, yet finishing eighth was a rewarding result for them. According to Weiss de Araujo, designing and building a car between just two people was quite an achievement. I actually had a similar experience once working with a small group on a project in university. We were up against larger teams with more resources, but we put in the work and ended up winning the competition. Hey, hey, comparing a university project to Formula One car building, that's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Well, the principle is the same, isn't it? It's all about making the most of what you've got and not being deterred by the size or resources of the competition. I suppose you're right. My apologies. It was a bit of a snide remark. No worries. We all have our moments. Now let's get back to the story. That year, Tarquini failed to qualify on eight occasions. However, that was nothing compared to Bern Schneider at Zach Speed in the following year. In a trying 1989, typically 13 cars vied for a spot in the top four that would progress to qualifying proper. After 13 straight failures to qualify, Schneider finally made the cut at Suzuka. Wisti Araujo vividly remembers the moment Schneider surged up the leaderboard to third in pre-qualifying as a highlight that pays you for the whole year. That's the beauty of this sport. Even in the face of adversity, moments of triumph can make all the effort worthwhile. Wisti Araujo said, These are emotions you cannot describe. It's worth one year of suffering going home all the time, only for that one time. In the old days, where you did this job for passion mainly, those are moments that you never forget. He can close his eyes and put himself back into that moment. My mom used to say something similar, that the sweetest victories are those that come after the greatest struggles. That's so true. The story of Weiss de Araujo is a testament to that. In 1990, he joined Leighton House, but it was a difficult start to the year. Drivers Ivan Capelli and Mauricio Gugelman struggled to qualify at times, and the team's impending financial doom had led to the appointment of a finance director intent on trimming funds. That must have been an incredibly challenging period. It was. Wisti Araujo even admits that he was not mature enough to handle the situation correctly and fell out with Adrian Newey before leaving for AGS to reunite with Tarquini from the French Grand Prix. However, the situation at AGS was no less dire, as owner Cyril de Rouvre had stopped investing. Staff went unpaid while a new owner was sought and just six team members traveled to Phoenix for the 1991 season opener to run its two JH25Bs for Tarquini and Johansson. That sounds like a truly dire situation. It was, but despite the challenges, Tarquini managed to finish a remarkable eighth at the race. 
During that weekend, the skeleton crew lacked the funds to pay a rental car deposit and relied on fast food takeaways bought by their loyal driver for sustenance. And in a show of solidarity, the FIA decreed that other teams should permit them entry to their hospitalities. That's the spirit of the sport, isn't it? Despite the competition, there's a sense of camaraderie and support among the teams. It reminds us that at the end of the day, they're all part of the same Formula One family. From AGS, Luis de Araujo moved on to join Lamborghini, where he worked with Forgieri, who's quite a legend in his own right. But even though Forgieri was highly respected due to his intelligence, Luis de Araujo found him chaotic to work with. That sounds like quite a unique work environment. Indeed, it was. Luis de Araujo said, He had a very fast-thinking brain, but he was also very Latin. We had 11 engines, I think, in Lamborghini, and nobody knew the specs of these engines. Nobody. You would come to a circuit and you would not even know what you had on the car. Hard to imagine working like that in Formula One today, isn't it? It is indeed. And to top it all, the Lamborghini car wasn't exactly a piece of art. Wisti Araujo didn't mince words when he described it as an absolute rubbish box. It had no downforce, flexing everywhere, and an engine that had a nice sound but guzzled a lot of fuel. Yet another testament to the changing times in Formula One, isn't it? Exactly. Weiss de Araujo even spent one more low-budget season of F1 with Fon Metal, once again teaming up with Tarquini, before he joined Umberto Grano's CBME outfit for the 1993 Italian Super Touring Championship. Just goes to show how varied an F1 career can be, you know? All this talk of engines and specs reminds me of my old banger, a Ford Cortina back in the day. She was a beauty, that one. I used to spend hours tinkering with her, changing spark plugs, oil filters. I remember this one time I had my entire head stuck in the engine compartment, trying to understand why it wouldn't start, and my mom came out with a cup of tea. Go on. I'd love to hear more about your adventures with your Cortina another time, mate. Maybe we should get back to the topic at hand? Oops, sorry. I did get a bit carried away there, didn't I? Let's continue with our discussion about Weiss de Araujo's journey in Formula One. Where were we? Ah, yes, his stint with Lamborghini. Wis de Araujo's move to touring cars was actually influenced by Tarquini, who had driven for TBM in 1992. He was responsible that I got into the BMWs, states Weiss de Araujo. So, I went to do super touring cars and forgot about Formula One. A complete shift in career direction. It's not every day you see someone make such a transition. Indeed, but it seemed to work out quite well for Wis de Araujo. He embarked on a decade-long stint with CBM that saw him clinch two Italian championships and participate in the European Super Touring Car Cup, its super production class, and the S2000-based European Touring Car Championship. A testament to his adaptability and passion for the sport, isn't it? Absolutely. And in 1993, Wisti Araujo was paired with touring car legend Roberto Ravaglia, a partnership that yielded the title in Wisti Araujo's first season in Tin Tops. Quite an impressive feat. It certainly is. Wis de Araujo speaks highly of Ravalia, describing him as like the Alain Prost of touring cars. He learned a lot from this legendary driver who had previously won European championships in 1986 and 88, the World Touring Car Championship in 87, the DTM in 89, and back-to-back -back Italian titles in 1990 and 91. Weiss de Araujo and Ravalia shared some thrilling rides together. Wes de Araujo recalls a specific incident when a tire blew at Monza's second Lesmo. Quite a scary experience, I imagine. Certainly sounds it. He said, There's so much stones and things coming into the cockpit when you go in the gravel that you understand why people should use full-face helmets. A stark reminder of the hazards of the sport. Yes, indeed. Ravalia also taught Wes de Araujo about the softer-than-usual setup. Wis de Araujo admits he always wanted to make the cars too stiff, but Ravalia taught him the value of a softer setup, especially in terms of precision in inputs. That's a valuable lesson. Absolutely. Wis de Araujo found touring cars to be an enjoyable challenge despite being initially behind F1 levels of preparation. He found it very satisfying that the team could build and develop its own chassis. They even had official engines from Germany and built the chassis themselves, sometimes incorporating six dampers in the car, heave dampers, push rods, and so on. Quite an interesting journey, don't you think? Yes, indeed. It just goes to show the diversity and complexity in motorsports. 
Just to recap for those who've just tuned in, our focus today has been on Peter Weiss de Araujo's career in motorsports. We've traced his path from Formula One to super touring cars, and even delved into his partnership with the legendary Roberto Ravaglia. Quite an exciting journey, isn't it? Absolutely. It's not often we get to talk about such a unique career switch, and it's been quite fascinating. Couldn't agree more. We've also discussed some of the key lessons Wisti Araujo learned, including the value of a softer car setup. Quite an enlightening insight, wouldn't you agree? Indeed, it certainly gives us a different perspective on the intricacies of the sport. Absolutely. And not to forget, we've also touched upon the satisfaction Wisti Araujo found in the team's ability to build and develop its own chassis. Now let's move on, shall we? Wisti Araujo made it clear that these were serious racing cars, like DTM cars, but only two liters. He spent several enjoyable years in touring cars at the CBM team. And that just reinforces my belief that each branch of motorsports comes with its own unique set of challenges and rewards. You know, my uncle used to say something similar. He'd always say, in every challenge, there's an opportunity to grow and learn. Wise words indeed. Let's delve deeper into Wies de Araujo's journey. In 1994, the Audi 80 was the car to have as Emmanuel Piro ruled the roost, before doubling up in 1995 with the A4. Yes, and then it was Ronaldo Capello who took over when Piro moved to the German Championship for 96. Though CBME's Emanuele Naspetti put up a strong fight and took the title down to the wire. Yes, he was indeed a formidable challenger. He, however, lost out due to a stop-go penalty for contact with Audi's Ivan Müller in the Vallelunga finale, dropping him to third in the standings behind his teammate Johnny Sokoto. Speaking of Sokoto, Wisti Araujo rates him as probably within the best two or three drivers I have had. Quite a compliment, wouldn't you agree? Indeed, such high praise from a figure like Wisti Araujo is no small achievement. But as my mother always used to say, even the best have their off days. Naspetti certainly proved that when he made up for his disappointment in 97 by taking the title. Just a quick sidebar, folks. If you're enjoying our deep dive into the world of motorsports, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to F1 Motor Fever Podcast. Your support really helps us keep delivering high-quality content for you. Indeed, and do share our episodes with your fellow motorsports enthusiasts. It really does make a difference. Absolutely. And remember, we have new episodes at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. every day. On race weekends, we have special episodes lined up for you. And every Thursday morning, we have an extended special episode on an epic topic. You don't want to miss out. Spot on. Now getting back on track. Now, moving on to the year 2000, we witnessed a merger between the Italian and German championships, forming the European Super Touring Cup. However, Giovanardi remained the man to beat, with CBME's lead driver Gianni Morbidelli finishing third in the points. Touring cars represented the first time Wisti Araujo had been able to truly invest himself into a team. It satisfied his desire to stick to a job for a decade. He reckons he probably would have stayed there forever if the team had not lost its work support at the end of 2000. Quite a testament to his commitment, isn't it? CBM has switched to the super production class for 2001, but Morbidelli only won once and finished fifth. The following year in the European Touring Car Championship, adopting the FIA's new Super 2000 rules was an even greater disappointment. Yes, with a Jazz Motorsport-built Honda Civic, the Euro F3000 race winner Salvatore Tavano failed to record a single point. Wisti Araujo remembers, every race we had a different engine. The car was good, but sometimes the engine came the night before the first free practice, and you would see that the exhaust wouldn't fit and things like that. Blimey, it's quite an insight into the intense dynamics of the motorsports world, isn't it? So much hard work, so much competitiveness, and so much passion. It's absolutely thrilling. What do you all think, my lovely audience? Are you finding these details as intriguing as we are? Don't forget to let us know in the comments, all right? We're really enjoying sharing these insights with you, and we hope you're enjoying it too. Thanks for being here with us. Now let's press on. Now things weren't always smooth sailing for Wisti Araujo. He mentioned how they went from being hopeless to the right direction, and then the program stopped. Motorsports can be quite the roller coaster ride, can't it? Absolutely, it's a world of high stakes and even higher emotions. But it's these challenges that often lead to the most worthwhile experiences. Can you give us some examples? 
Well, a perfect example would be his return to the Italian squad in single-seaters for the 2003-2004 F-3000 campaigns. After that, he joined Campos for the new era of GP2 in 2005 and stayed until 2017. After two barren seasons, Campos became a winner when Giorgio Pantano joined Vitali Petrov in 2007. And that just goes to show how persistence can lead to success in the world of motorsports. But it wasn't just about the drivers, was it? Quite right. Lucas de Grassi joined Petrov in 2008 as Campos won the team's championship. By this stage, it had already secured investment from Alejandro Agag, who Wisti Araujo had persuaded to take on Pantano despite the experienced Italian's lack of budget. And that's often how it goes, isn't it? The teams behind the drivers play such a crucial role in the success of any race. Absolutely. It's always a team effort. The team would be entered under the ADAX banner from 2009 to 2013 as Agag took overall control. The team moved from its base in Alzera, half an hour south of Valencia, to a new site close to the airport. But as Wis de Araujo confirms, the manpower was always the same with Chris Murphy continuing as technical director. The longest career stint of Wis de Araujo was with Campos, which took its first GP2 win at Magni Cour in 2007 with Pantano and went on to win two teams' titles. That's right. And if we look at the roster of drivers in those years, we see some notable names, don't we? Absolutely. In 2009, Romain Grosjean was Nico Hülkenberg's closest championship challenger until he graduated mid-season to F1. Yet Petrov still finished second, as the team also finished runner-up in the team's standings. A remarkable achievement, isn't it? And that wasn't the end of the team's success. Not at all. That result was repeated in 2010 when Sergio Perez finished second to Pastor Maldonado. Adax then won the team's title again in 2011 with Charles Pick and Guido van der Gaard. Unfortunately, the following years were challenging for the team. Indeed. Adax slipped to eighth in 2012 with Johnny Sicado Jr. and Josef Kral, then in 2013 went winless for the first time since 2006. Drivers Jake Rosenzweig and Rio Harianto managed just 22 points between them as the team slid to 12th in the team's standings. But as is often the case in the world of motorsports, change was just around the corner. And in this case, it was a return to old grounds. Yes, Alejandro Agag moved on to Formula E, and he gave all the material back to Adrian Campos. So they moved back to the old workshop where they had begun, according to Weiss de Araujo. A humbling experience, but an essential one in the ever-evolving world of Formula One, isn't it? The wins returned along with the Campos name for 2014, with Arthur Pick claiming the Hungary feature. Harianto was back in 2015 and upstaged Pick with three victories, lifting the team from sixth to fourth. But that didn't last long, did it? No. Unfortunately, it slipped back to sixth in 2016, despite Mitch Evans leading Sean Galael in a 1-2 finish at the Red Bull Ring. The year following GP2's rebranding as Formula 2 was disappointing, with no wins. But they did end the year with a tantalizing lineup, didn't they? Yes, they ended with the lineup of Lando Norris and Alex Palu. Now don't quote me on this, but I believe that's the year they took a major leap forward. Why don't we call Victoria to confirm? Sounds like a plan. All right, let's give her a ring then. Hello, Victoria. Hope you're doing well. We're right in the middle of our podcast recording, and we were discussing the year when Lando Norris and Alex Palou joined Campos. Was that the year the team made significant progress? Could you confirm that for us? Ah, right, got it. Thanks for the help, Victoria. All right, so Victoria confirms that while Norris and Palou are incredible drivers, the team didn't quite make the leap we were hoping for that year. But it's always fascinating to review these historical events and see how they've shaped the sport we love today. Weiss de Araujo did confess at one point that he missed having a proper engine. He spent two more seasons in single-seaters with HWA in F2 and Jenser in F3 before embarking on his latest sports car racing challenge for 2023. And that's with Team Virage, correct? Yes, indeed. He had previously worked with Team Virage founder Philippe Gotheron at Campos for several years, 
and was happy to accept an invitation to run its LMP2 car in the Elms. Their Pro-AM lineup, consisting of Tatiana Calderon, Ian Rodriguez, and Alex Matchell, took a best finish of sixth at Spa. That's quite a change from single-seaters, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a different beast altogether. Wistia Araujo mentioned how you have three drivers, all different in quality and even height. Each one tells you different things about the car balance, so you have to find a compromise with three people. Now this reminds me of a joke. Why don't they play hide-and-seek in Formula One? I don't know. Why don't they? Because good luck hiding when you're always racing to be ahead. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha ha. That's a good one. And quite true, there are no hiding places in this sport. Luis de Araujo admits that previously he wasn't the best in communicating with the drivers, and maybe he was a bit too hard on them. But he believes that with maturity, you learn how to handle such things better. It seems like dealing with people is as much a part of the job as understanding the machinery. Precisely. Now here's a surprise. Even though Wisti Araujo has had a decorated career, the Le Mans 24 Hours remains a box to be checked for him. That's quite surprising, isn't it? Quite. He doesn't have a motorsport bucket list, so to speak. But he is clear that if he did, there are plenty of things that aren't on it. And he hasn't ruled out the possibility of engineering stateside one day. Seems like he's always up for a new challenge. Absolutely. His philosophy is quite inspiring. He says, in the end, it all comes down to what you want. Are you positive or negative? If you are positive, you will always find the aspect of the difficult situation and then make the best out of this. And right now, it's making racing drivers quicker. Wise words, wouldn't you say? Indeed, a lesson for us all, I reckon. Luis de Araujo likes to challenge conventional wisdom. For instance, some people automatically increase tire pressure when it's wet. But he insists on asking for the reason, the physical explanation behind this action. He doesn't accept, because my previous boss said so, as an answer. That's interesting. Can you give us an example of a situation where the conventional wisdom was challenged? Absolutely. Let's consider pit stop strategies. It's commonplace to follow a certain strategy because it's been successful before. But Wisti Araujo wouldn't accept this. He'd want a thorough analysis of the current race conditions, the position of the car, the wear of the tires, and only then a decision about the pit stop would be made. That's a fresh perspective. It's about understanding why things are done a certain way, and being open to discussing it as a group. Weisty Araujo believes that you might come up with a solution that's different to a method you've been using for, let's say, 30 years. I suppose that's how innovation happens in this sport. Indeed, he emphasizes that the most valuable lesson is to think for yourself, take responsibility for decisions, and be able to justify your reasons. It's not about magic, it's all physics. And you don't need to be a super genius. What you need is dedication. Hard work and passion bring results. One more very important thing that Wisti Araujo stresses is knowing oneself. He encourages people to take personality tests, like Red Bull's Wing Finder, to understand themselves better. That's interesting. I suppose understanding yourself can impact how you interact with others and approach your work. Exactly. He believes that understanding your personality can help you identify areas where you need improvement. It's part of his philosophy of continuous self-improvement, which is paramount in a sport as demanding as Formula One. And it's not just about knowing yourself, but also having the courage to take the plunge, isn't it? Absolutely. His mantra seems to be, don't be afraid, jump in. His conviction in this philosophy is so strong that he makes everyone who comes to work with him take the personality test to better understand themselves. And that probably creates a more harmonious and efficient working environment, doesn't it? Indeed. It's all about embracing curiosity, self-improvement, and being unafraid to challenge the norms. We have a lot to learn from Mr. Wisti Araujo's approach to motorsport engineering. Thanks for tuning in to F1 Motor Fever podcast today, folks. We've had a riveting discussion about Wisti Araujo's unique approach to motorsport engineering. In a sport that's all about speed, sometimes you have to slow down and reflect, and today's episode did just that. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any future episodes. Every click helps us bring more insightful content your way. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, we'd love it if you could share our channel with your friends, family, and fellow Formula One fanatics. Heh, that's right. And you know, I have a feeling that our pal Enzo Watts is going to love this episode. I mean, who doesn't enjoy a good debate on tire pressures, am I right? 
So make sure you're all tuned in for the next episode. We can't spill the beans just yet, but let's just say it's going to be a cracker. Absolutely, we're already excited about it. But before we close for the day, let me just say, we are truly grateful for your continued support. We'll be back with another episode of F1 Motor Fever Podcast soon. Until then, remember, pedal to the metal. Keep your gaze on the road. Our channel's content is pure gold.